I hear sounds. All right, participants okay, it's, have it's, hit 100. It's, it's, it's on YouTube. We're there. We're good. Cool. Okay, and we're over. So that's a plus. Uh, all right, well, it's 5 o'clock. Uh, let's, let's get cracking. Um, it's 5 o'clock everybody... somewhere. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. Uh, <laughs> so uh, so welcome to the event. Uh, we You've probably just heard our whole spiel in the previous session. So... Uh, without a lot of further ado, I just want to say that we're going to we're going to have Q and A uh, after Jim is finished talking. Um, you can try to write uh, if you write questions in the chat. We will we'll try to um, at, if we have time, we may have like hand raising and calling people. Uh, so we'll try to kind of just make do. Um, I will pass it over to you, Rick. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. This is the virtual reality overview presented by Jim Harp. Well, Jim bought a L'Oreal camera from Real 3D shortly after the birth of his first daughter, Beverly, in 1995. He's been enthusiastically exploring stereoscopic and immersive imagery ever since. Current interests include VR 180 and 3D 360 degrees, medium format 3D and infrared shooting. Jim trained as a drummer, percussionist, with a focus on a musical theater, and prior to the pandemic, kept busy playing and programming electronic music systems for theater. And take it away, Jim. Great, thanks, Rick. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, this is a huge topic, virtual reality. Uh, and we've got about half an hour, so we're not, we're not gonna cover the whole thing. And I'll apologize in advance that we might not have a lot of time to take questions, but I do want to mention, um, we also have a special interest group for VR. Uh, highly recommended. We're doing that tomorrow, 1215 Pacific, 315 uh, Eastern time, uh, various other time zones around the world. And uh, we're going to be experimenting a bit further. And that'll be another opportunity to talk about this topic. Uh, you, there, you know, there's been a couple of times in recent years where it, you'll hear people saying, oh, 3D is dead. They stopped making 3D TVs. Uh, Viewmaster went out of business, sort of. Uh, and you know, you'll hear, oh, there, there's an ongoing thread about why 3D isn't popular. Um, but you know, I, I see right now as being the golden age for 3D because uh, at this very moment, millions of people have very high quality digital 3D stereoscopes that they're strapping to their heads and playing with. Because uh, that's really what a VR headset is. Uh, to me, I, I just see virtual reality headsets as being the next logical evolution of the Holmes viewer and all these other 3D devices. Now, they do quite a lot more, but they're still very valuable tools for stere stereographers and people who are interested in 3D. And they also offer a lot of opportunities to expand what you're doing as a 3D photographer into uh, other, other realms. Uh, now, when you talk about virtual reality, it's one of these terms that kind of gets misused or isn't always used correctly. The definition I put up here is what I consider to be you know, ac an accurate definition of what virtual reality is. It really is a digitally created reality, an environment that you can walk around in, that you can interact with, that you can actually, you know, either using a headset or glasses, maybe these days you can track your hands. Uh, still, you very often use controllers, but it's literally an environment that you can be within. So this sort of immersive photography, the 360 degree photography, the VR 180, this really isn't VR photography because you can get a wonderful image, uh, 360 degree image, uh, very fun to look at, but you can't walk around it really. You can't interact with it. So I, I, the term I, I use for that is immersive. Uh, I thought it'd be interesting just to kind of look a little bit at where we started with this not that long ago, before 2017, these pictures to the left are showing you the sorts of things people were having to do to take 360 degree videos and photographs. Uh, you can see uh, the, the common strategy was to use, oh, between eight and 24 GoPro cameras or other sort of action cams with wide angle lenses. Uh, and it would take hours and hours of computer processing to stitch together these images into some sort of usable 360 degree image. And honestly, there weren't a lot of people doing 3D 360 at that time, because once you add 3D, you know, try to get 
a stereoscopic image in a 360 degree realm. It's quite complicated. It was very complicated back then. And then you can see over to the right, right around 2017, things really improved dramatically. Uh, companies like uh, Insta360 came out with self-contained solutions and also much improved software. So it suddenly became quite easy to take very good 3, 3D 360 uh, imagery. Um, here's just kind of an overview of what our formats are for what I would call immersive photography. And uh, I just wanted to sort of give a comparison of these, uh, these different formats. And just for comparison, I set up a tripod in a garden you can see the very first image there is a Fuji W3, just to give a, a frame of reference. It's on the same tripod. Right below it, we see a VR180 image, uh, which is basically giving us half the hemisphere. And then to the right, you see the over under 3D of the output of a Insta360 Pro. This is a 3D 360. And as you can see, it's formatted to over under. That's typically how it's done. Now I have a little more detail on these uh, specific formats. VR180 is a little bit of a newer one and I think it's a wonderful format. And it's also something that's very comfortable for those of us who are working in 3D. Uh, unfortunately, my favorite VR180 camera, the Insta360 Evo has been discontinued. Supposedly they're going to make a solution for their new Insta360 One to do it, but it's not out yet. But I have some other uh, options. You can see the Views XR camera is still available pretty inexpensive. If you want a professional uh, VR180 camera, I have the Z Cam K1 Pro pictured here. That's about $3,000. Uh, and there are also people doing things like putting two red cams with uh, fisheye lenses together for you know very expensive solutions that can do very professional work. But you can get really fun, interesting images with something like the Views XR. And so you can see basically what all these immersive formats start with fisheye lenses. And uh, what you're seeing at the top there is basically what would be considered the raw output of the, of the Evo. It's just basically two fisheye Im images. Uh, the way it's prepared to be viewed in a viewer is it's mapped to a rectilinear format. This is what they call stitching, but really nothing is stitched for VR 180 usually. It's usually just two lenses and the image being mapped to a you know, rectilinear format, which the viewer then has software, which gives you something amazingly close to an orthoscopic uh, view. Uh, I'll go on a little bit more uh, and look at what 3D 360, how that's being taken generally. And uh, what I did, that same image of the garden, I took with a uh, Insta360. And you can see what the Insta360 does. And the Kandao and some of the other cameras are all quite similar. They're taking multiple fisheye lenses. And so what you're seeing in the upper left there are the six fisheye images that are taken by the Insta360. And it has its own proprietary software that stitches those together into the rectilinear over under you see below you. Uh, for me as a user with this camera, it's a piece of cake. Uh, it takes a little while, but I don't really have to do any heavy lifting mentally. I just basically drag the, a folder that has these six fisheye lenses into the software they give you with the camera and tell it, yeah, please make me a 3D image of it. And that's what you get. And just, you know, once again, this is a major improvement over what people were going through not that long ago and you know, before 2017, there were a lot of people trying to do this, but it was a huge complicated project. So it's, it's really good times for doing this. And um, I thought uh, if anyone has their anaglyph glasses, I just thought it'd be interesting to show some output of these cameras. Uh, I would love it if I could pass around VR goggles to everyone here. Uh, I haven't been able to figure out how to do that. That's usually what I like to do at the conventions is have my uh, hotel room as kind of a show space. So not being able to do that, what we're seeing here is an anaglyph uh, that I created from the output of the uh, Insta360 Evo. I'll zoom in a little bit. Um, just kind of gives you a sense of the depth. And of course, this is not mapped uh, rectilinearly. This is the fisheye output. But I've had a lot of fun using the camera to take fisheye images. Now this I'm gonna zoom in a little bit on. You'll have to pardon me. This is a Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo. And um, what we're looking at here is an anaglyph I created from that over under of the Insta360. So this is the closest thing I could come up with to kind of let you all see what the output of these cameras looks like over a Zoom meeting. Now I do want to mention, it's really not that difficult to see what we're talking about in terms of immersive photography. If you're not familiar with it, um, I highly recommend if you have a smartphone of recent vintage, 
and uh, really almost any iPhone or Android phone will do it, uh, get the YouTube VR app. Uh, this is different from just calling up YouTube on your browser. There's actually an app for Android phones and for um, iPhones uh, called YouTube, you know, the YouTube app. And once you're in the YouTube app, if you find a VR 180 or a 3D 360 video, you'll see a little icon that looks like a tiny little stereoscope in the lower right corner. If you press that icon, it will actually present it to you in a format that you can look at, you know, left and right, and you can move your phone around. And uh, here's a nice little tip. If you have no facilities, you don't have a VR viewer, you don't even have a cardboard viewer, you can use the lorgnette that the NSA was kind enough to send us all and hold that up to your phone. It works even better if you have powerful reading glasses, but you can actually kind of cobble together a little VR viewer just from your smartphone and the YouTube VR app. Now, I uh, have some links. Uh, maybe uh, Dave or someone uh, could paste those if, if they're not on the chat. I, I linked together a couple of different interesting sites. And one thing I wanted to bring to your attention is just there are quite a few interesting videos on YouTube, a lot, a lot of great resources already on YouTube. If you have a VR headset, such as an Oculus Go, uh, an Oculus Rift, or a Quest, you can get the YouTube VR app, which is even better, YouTube VR. It's a free app, and that lets you use those headsets also to view these videos. Now, uh, there's another bit of really recent good news for anyone who's interested in this format. As you could see earlier, I was talking about you know, the Insta360, that was about a $2,500 camera. Uh, it's no longer being made. You can sometimes find them used for a thousand, but they're hard to find. Uh, but thanks, uh, and there's so many things to thank this gentleman for, but thanks to Masuji uh, Sudo's cleverness, uh, you can experiment with taking uh, 3D 360 photo photographs very inexpensively. Uh, he's created a $1.99 app called 3D 360, which works for, I believe, both Android and iPhone. And this will let you take any 2D 360 camera. And I, I just put as a reference on eBay, you can get a Ricoh Theta. You know, they show up used around 100, 150. Uh, there's, I, as far as I know, just about any good 360 2D camera. And the 2D 360 cameras are ubiquitous. People have tons of them. And uh, this, as you can see on the slide I have up here, uh, what, what this app does, you basically just take a cha-cha. You take a 360 cha-cha and the app is very clever. It, it knows how to process, basically it has to reverse left from right, and right from left in the two directions. Uh, it's doing quite a lot of heavy lifting and the results are really quite amazing. Uh, the one thing to keep in mind when using this is you, you wanna use a very narrow stereo base. You can see he's, He's recommending, I think, three centimeters. And you generally don't want to have anything too close to the straight edge going from either side. Basically, the stitch point of this kind of camera is right between the two lenses. So there are limitations. But within those limitations, you know, for $120, you can go out and experiment with creating uh, stereoscopic 360-degree content. And that's, and that's something that's just come out in the last couple months. And uh, it's, it's an amazing opportunity and I encourage everyone to play with it because this really is fun. And it's, uh, it's now possible to take these, there's any number of ways to share these images, of course, with VR headsets, but also just with people who have a smartphone and you know, any number of viewers. And we'll talk about that a little bit more as we go. Um, in fact, this brings up the next thing I wanted to talk about is what are your options for viewing uh, you know, VR content, immersive photos, Beg your pardon. So um, the first thing to uh, consider is that if you don't want to go and buy a VR headset, if you have a, a smartphone, you know, and it's been made anytime in the last couple of years, you've already got a pretty good 3D immersive viewer. You have the everything you need to do that. All you need is something to clip onto it. And so I quite like these clip on glasses. Um, there's any number of types of them, but you can see they're designed this first set designed just to clip onto your phone. A lot of them fold, so you can even just keep them in your pocket. And I very often just have a pair of those with me. They're not expensive. And you can clip, clip them onto your phone and uh, just show people your 3D images that you took. And if you buy Masuji's, um, uh, his app, you can also buy the uh, Stereoid Viewer. Um, you've got everything you need to show people this stuff. Uh, the, kind of the next step up from that is what's called the Cardboard Viewer, which is more of a box. And you can see that down there. Um, Cardboard viewer it gives you a little bit more of an immersive experience. 
uh, because you basically are, are not seeing the world around you as you are with a little strap on viewer. And these are also quite inexpensive. Um, so, you know, the main, main message I, I want to give here is just that you really, you can look at this stuff, you can check out immersive photography, you can see these things without having to spend a fortune. Uh, and you can experiment with it inexpensively as well, which is very exciting. Now, uh, another link that I had put in the chat, and um, I'm depending on, on these fine gentlemen to repaste them because it's more than I, I can handle to paste chat links and look at slides at the same time. But uh, there's a very interesting uh, company called Raiz, R-A-I-Z, uh, that does photogrammetry. And as I said earlier, this immersive stuff, the stuff that we're doing with these 360 degree or VR 180, it's not really virtual reality photography because you can't move around it. You're not creating an environment. You're basically letting people stand in one place perfectly still and look around. Now, that's quite a wonderful thing to be able to do, but it's very exciting that uh, there's also a lot of movement towards what would be actual virtual reality photography. In other words, being able to photograph a place and let your viewer walk around it to really experience what it's like to be someplace. And so the, uh, this company Rays, R-A-I-Z, uh, if I understand correctly, they're getting ready to put out an app for the Oculus Quest, uh, which is going to uh, basically allow you to look at their virtual reality photographs, their, their captures of different environments. And there's some examples of this on YouTube and it's, it's quite a complex thing that they're, they're doing. They're basically creating a, a point cloud map and then uh, in a sense, pasting the images on it within three dimensions. They use a software called Unity to do it. It's, it's amazing. And it's one of these things uh, I recommend, click on the link in the video or go on YouTube and search Rays. You, you'll see it. It's, it just gives you a sense of where this is going. And I think it's going very quickly. Um, I originally, what interested me in 3D was just the, the real feeling of wanting to let someone know what it was like to be someplace. If I'm at the Grand Canyon, a really nice 3D picture really let me convey to someone you know, look at this slide. This is what it's like to be there. And that's certainly what got me interested in immersive photography. And you'll see what these guys are doing and what photogrammetry is going to take us to very soon, I think, is the ability to really let someone know, I went to the, you know, I went to Tokyo. Here's what it's like to be there. Uh, now let's go on to what's going on in the market as far as virtual reality headsets. Uh, and now we're kind of getting a little bit higher up in money and we're also getting higher up in what they can do. Now this first one I've listed here has been discontinued, the Oculus Go, uh, but it's still quite a neat little product and there's plenty of them out there. You can get them on eBay very inexpensively. Uh, what the Oculus Go does not do is it doesn't really let you fully experience virtual reality because it doesn't have what we call six degrees of freedom. In other words, it doesn't let you move around a room. It doesn't let you, if you're playing a game like um, oh, Robo Recall, you can't actually reach out and grab the robot. But it's still a pretty neat little device. And especially for, for a low, low cost, it's a great way to be able to kind of get your feet wet in what VR can do, to be able to look at a lot of content. And, and it does a great job playing back immersive content you've taken or others have taken. Now, if someone was just to come to this workshop and say, what's the, what's the VR headset I should buy? You know, I, I don't really know anything about this. What do I get? The Oculus Quest is the answer. I don't know if any of our moderators would comment further on that, but that's what I would tell you. You know, if you don't know anything about this, you have a couple hundred bucks, what do you buy? The Oculus Quest is the go-to product these days for a couple of reasons. Uh, you don't need a computer to connect to it without expensive graphics card. So in other words, when you see that $400 price there, that's all you need. Uh, it does a very, as good a job as just about anything out there at playing back your immersive content, but it also lets you experience this idea of what virtual reality is. It lets you play around in a virtual environment. It lets you try a lot of this new technology. And it's also, it's such a popular format that it's where most of the development is being done these days. I, I would say that really the, the Oculus Quest has more people working on stuff for it and fun things for it than, than any other, you know, any other sort of virtual reality device that's out there. So it's, a, they've actually been very hard to find in recent months. I think that's becoming a little bit easier Back in April, you couldn't find them unless you're willing to pay twice as much <laughs> to a reseller because they, they were just, they were unobtainium. But that, that is improving. Now, um, an interesting thing I should mention about these three options we see here, uh, the next one is the Oculus Rift, which you connect to a computer. All three of these uh, products have the same resolution, 1280 by 1440 pixels. Um, it's actually so a little higher, I think, Jim. Oh, really? Did I get that number wrong? Okay, but somewhere around there. It's uh, 
it says right there i got it on the internet but but it's 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 somewhere in that ballpark right the resolution that's yeah, i think it's yeah 14 by that's 1440 by 1600 maybe or yeah, they're all they're all the same though. I mean, they're all they all you know. Sort of my point is that all these three products all have the same quote resolution, and it's just good to know we spend so much time, especially in digital photography, we're so focused on resolution, but resolution is not the entire story uh, with VR, because a lot of what really matters, especially if you get beyond just looking at an immersive, you know, an immersive video that you've shot, a 360 video doesn't actually take that much power, that much graphics power to render. And so the Oculus Go does a great job at it. But however, if you want to get into some really interesting virtual reality apps, one of my favorites is Google Earth. And if you've ever been at a convention and stopped by my hotel room where I had the VR, VR rig set up, I usually would show people Google Earth first because that's the thing that lets you, you know, you can call up your hometown and walk around your house as a giant, or you can zoom up into the air. And it's a very compelling experience of really seeing a place. You can't do that on a Quest because that takes an incredible amount of processing power. There's a lot of really interesting graphics and artistic things that you need a computer for. And that kind of brings up the next page, which is just that even though the, the Quest is fun because it's all, you know, you can use it uh, entirely self-contained. If you really want to get into the fun of, of creating artistic experiences, if you want to really see some really incredible new worlds you do end up needing at this point and this might change in another year another year or two you really need a computer with a powerful graphics card so when you see that three three hundred ninety nine dollar price for the oculus rift as opposed to the quest same price but the rift also needs a two thousand to three thousand dollar computer connected to it to work uh so you can see it really is a more expensive solution you get you get some really interesting things for that but it really is more in the realm of creating really interesting environments to walk around, creating interesting pieces of art. If you're just looking at immersive photography, this is perhaps overkill. And so that's once again, why I would say, since the Go is no longer available, if you're buying one product to get started, these days the Quest is it. Uh, I have also on here, you know, just a sense of what the high end gets to. Uh, to really get into the high end virtual reality, to really experience these environments, you need something like the Valve Index uh, there's also one coming out called the Reverb G2 that's coming out this fall. The more powerful these things get, the higher the resolution gets. You need much more graphics power. You end up needing, a, I think, to run any of the newer high-end VR headsets, a GTX 2080 graphics processing unit is pretty much what's required. So you can easily get up into six, six grand. Uh, I don't know, anything to add to that, Dave? Well, yeah. So, so really, the Quest we we would recommend right now as uh, as the entry because the Quest, uh, in addition to being a standalone device, uh, has really become kind of a Swiss Army knife uh, of of a headset. There's a yeah, can, good point. Yeah, you can plug it into your gaming PC and you can play. Uh, so, so basically, it's a cell phone processor inside of a, a a digital stereoscope. So it's a it's a cell phone in there, and when you plug it into the gaming PC, then the gaming PC does all the heavy lifting and then just makes all the nice graphics and sends it to your uh, headset. Yeah, and this, um, is a, this is using something that Oculus came out with called the Link. You basically can connect a USB-C cable. So what this means is you can buy a Quest and then later on you can upgrade to a high-end graphics computer and then do all that cool stuff. Right. So it, it also is, it is a great advantage that you can start with that and then know that you can move up if you really want to get deeply into developing or, you know. And, 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 and not only that, is that with the development of, of fast internet, there's cloud-based computing where you can essentially rent uh, a high-end gaming PC at a server near you. And for like $12 a month, uh, you can just stream the game down to your headset with the Quest. Um, I haven't tried it yet. Uh, it's, yeah, it's, I've heard about that. I'm, I have to say I'm skeptical because latency is so critical with this stuff. You need a really and, fast connection. Yeah, and, and I mean, the, the other thing, you know, you'll notice people will complain about having to have a wire tethered to a computer. But to really run the high-end stuff, you really do need that wire, at least at this juncture. Although not totally, because you also have virtual piece, virtual yeah. desktop, which can stream it across. And for me, I, I don't have a great router. So that that's mm -hmm. another option is to, yeah. again, have your gaming PC just wirelessly stream it across to the headset. And with the right setup, it, it does really work kind of decently. 
Yeah, and this stuff is all, this is moving very quickly. All this stuff is moving very quickly. It's changing quickly. Supposedly there's a new version of the Quest coming out in the fall. Although I always tell people, don't wait for the new thing that's coming out. If, if you want to learn about something, if you want to experience it, buy the product that's out now and work with it. Don't, you know, if you start waiting for the next new thing that's coming out, you'll never end up, you'll end up never buying anything. Uh, another, you have about five more minutes. Okay. All right. Yeah, I guess we're not going to be taking questions. I'm sorry, folks, but we look forward to hearing your questions over time. I'm going to just try to quickly branch over some other really big topics. Uh, there are a lot of really cool strategies to share your 3D photos. And a lot of us have just a huge amount of great 3D imagery we've taken through the years. Uh, so I'm just going to mention a couple of the tools that let you do that. You can use an app called Big Screen VR if you have something like an Oculus Go or Quest which lets you use a computer to put your 3D stills or videos up and you can actually sit. And we've had a great time doing this. I hope we'll have a chance during the convention to maybe throw an informal one of these together. Uh, it's quite amazing. Uh, there's some, there's some viewer, viewer apps for VR such as Pegasus. Um, there's a couple others that also will let you put up your 3D images. And um, we're gonna have at the SIG tomorrow, I'm hoping we're gonna actually have uh, Jim Prusi from Orbix 360. That's one of the links I put in chat. And this is a company that's uh, developing some amazing solutions for letting people create their own 360 degree environments, including uh, putting your 3D photographs up as if they were in a gallery that you can walk around. And, and this is very cutting edge stuff. I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing more about what they're doing. But you know, do, do keep in mind that these are stereoscopes people are putting on their heads, even if they don't realize it. And they are able to show your stereoscopic imagery and your stereoscopic movies. And uh, there's a lot of opportunities, I think, for those of us who have all this great content and all these wonderful vintage views to use this medium to, to share them, share those. So I encourage everyone, everyone here to look into that. Uh, the next thing I, I thought I'd just quickly tell you about the clean box. Uh, this is a device, uh, very appropriate for our times that will sterilize a VR headset in one minute using ultraviolet light, make it pandemic safe. Uh, so those of us who wanna be able to share our work on 3D headsets, this thing costs about $1,800 and it's worth it these days, I'm sad to say. The last topic, and I'm really gonna be brushing over this because I don't wanna cut into our amazing next presenter, Jim McManus, who's gonna talk about conversions and we'll have even a harder time fitting his topic in. But augmented reality, you might've heard that term Augmented reality basically means that instead of the VR headset blocking your view of the world, you see the world around you and you see digital stuff overlaid on it. Uh, currently available, I mean, this is currently being used as the Microsoft HoloLens. It's mostly being used for enterprise, for you know, corporations. You really probably can't go to Best Buy and pick one up. But what you see here are two examples of how it's used. Here you have a hypothetical mechanic on the bottom. As he's repairing his engine, he's seeing in front of him floating in space it, it can actually see what he's working on and give him information about it. Above that, you see a medical student who's actually able to train with a physical skeleton standing in front of him that he can interact with way ahead of a cadaver. Um, just to let you know, and uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll certainly fill this in, but you can actually get augmented reality for yourself pretty cheap. There's this really cool product called the Lenovo Mirage, which uses your smartphone and lets you actually try this technology out now. And the last little bit, and I know we're out of time, but um, just this last week, from my point of view, the future has arrived. Uh, and I really mean that. There's something really big that I think is gonna be a memorable date. Uh, just this week, a company called Unreal, who makes very small augmented reality glasses, is now shipping to Korea um, these glasses, augmented reality glasses, bundled with the Samsung Galaxy Note 20. So you can see basically the smartphone has now become the portable computer that these devices need. And as smartphones are getting more powerful, they really are becoming little portable computers. And the Unreal glasses are basically the display, the um, ultimate display for your smartphone. And you can kind of see, get a sense of that in this picture. There's someone wearing the glasses with their phone and they're basically able to see the menu spread throughout them anywhere in the room. They could hypothetically have 20 foot screens, 10 screens surrounding them, they could have all those things we talked about with the HoloLens. So this is the direction I see things are going in. I'm not saying it's necessarily a good thing, but I think within a few years, smartphones are gonna have augmented reality glasses with them and you'll be able to walk around and see digital information, digital imagery, ads, who knows what. So the future is quite something and this is the future and we certainly look forward to talking more about it in the future. 
I'm about out of time. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks to our presenters and all the technical help. And hang on for Jim McManus, because that's going to be awesome. Thank you, Jim. All right, thanks. Should I leave, or what do I do? I, I, I know we got our next, <laughs> our next customers here. Well, you, you, you get booted out. Or can I stay and watch Jim's? Uh, I could use I could use to learn a few things here. I don't know. Is Jimmy even here, or is, or is Jim? Or I'll talk more. I could talk another half hour if he's busy. No problem. I, I... <laughs> There's a couple questions uh, that, that that came in. Um, yeah, I mean, if you want to go to any questions, I, I mean, I, I you know, I would love to have. Um, you know. Okay, I made him be the co-host. There was someone mentioned Tilt Five. Oh I yeah, I, I'm waiting for mine. Yeah, Tilt Five is another thing. I ordered one, so. Yeah. I so sure essentially, hope they can get it done. So, do you, uh, do you want to explain what that is? Well, Tilt Five is another approach to, and, and please, when Jim gets on here, kick me off. But Tilt Five, worth googling. What they're what they've done is they basically created a board game, and they're using technology that reflects light directly onto these glasses from the board game, so that you see three dimensional digital objects that you can interact with, and they can actually use it as a preview. For something like Unity, in a funny way, it's almost like another approach to what they're doing with the looking glass. They're letting you see digital objects in sort of real space that you can interact with. It's going to end up being, uh, I think, the world's most amazing board game. And people will be able to sit there and it'll basically be the Star Wars, uh, that little chess set Chewbacca plays on with the, the things. That's Ooh, what it's cool. going to be in real I life. Play that. Well, it's, it's, oh, here he is. All right, here's the man. All right, you guys are in luck. You've got a real here. presenter now. Thank I was you sending a flurry okay. of types to Dave. Uh, I can't unmute myself. <laughs> oh, well, that's a feature. That's not a bug. Uh, yes, yes. It's a feature, not a bug. Feature, not a bug. <laughs> and I'm going nice to mute job, myself. Jim. Have at it. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Thank you, man. Great job. Appreciate okay, that. Sure. So we want to kick it over to probably Rick, who probably wants to unmute and give you a little bit of a, a pre, uh, here we go. All right, uh, the next uh, workshop is called Conversion Control by Jim McManus. And Jim has been a 3D photographer and NSA member for over 25 years, opening eyes to new dimensions in stereo with a variety of home-built twin camera rigs. He's glad to present this workshop on conversions containing a few of the many tricks he's got up his sleeve. Plus, you can go with him on a journey in this year's 3D theater to create images for permanent exhibit at Niagara Falls uh, State Park. And also relive your 3D con memories from many past NSA conventions with all our friends. Visit his website at www.lifeis3d.com for more information on Stereo 3D and the products and services Jim can provide. Take it away, Jim. Thank you, Rick. I appreciate that, man. I really appreciate not only you guys doing such hard work to put all this on, you know, it's the first time for everybody, but also to all the uh, attendees, you know, we're, uh, we're gonna have a great time and learn a lot and have a lot of fun. And in lieu of being able to see everybody in person, I really think, you know, we're gonna do a great job of it. So it's the next best thing. Um, I just wanted to mention that I started doing conversions kind of out of necessity on that particular Niagara job, there was a few images that I just couldn't take for various reasons. And so I had to convert. And it was either like, gosh, do I, uh, you know, uh, do, go down the rabbit hole and pay somebody and then not have the time to correct an error, you know, because the project, the, the, the deadline was approaching fast. So I just learned some stuff myself, spent a few sleepless nights up all night. And we've all got photos that we wish were taken in 3D, you know, whether it's an old treasured family photo or, or so just something where we didn't have a 3D camera. So um, it is possible and hopefully this workshop will show you um, that you can get a good start on it yourself. And if you don't have time or if it proves too difficult, then uh, contact me and I'll be glad to talk about doing a conversion uh, for you because I really want to open that up as part of uh, my new business. My audio business is certainly tapered off in this pandemic. So always looking for new things and VR and conversions, it all relates together. So I'm rebuilding my website right now to contain all that. But uh, real quick before we get started, um, I will be, this is a pre-recorded workshop simply because uh, there's a, a great danger of uh, thunderstorms here in uh, in, Tamp in uh, Orlando and Central Florida. And also I just had too much information to cram in to, uh, to be able to show you guys in one, in one you know, without having it pre-recorded and having the power of editing. 
So if you've seen this before at the NYSA workshops, there's going to be a lot of new info. Uh, just stay tuned past the talky part in the beginning, and we'll get to some examples really quickly. Um, and finally, uh, I'll be back for Q&A at the end. So uh, I'll hop back on and uh, we'll go live. And I think that's it. I'm just checking my pre-flight pre -flight checklist here. Uh, yeah, I guess that's it. Crumple up that piece, piece of paper and let us go. Let us go live. I'm assuming y'all can see me, right? So if I share my screen, yeah, all right, we'll see. All right, here we go. Bear with me and I appreciate you guys uh, watching this and hopefully you'll learn, learn something very cool. for joining us in this evening. Hey, Jim, uh, sorry, could you, can you, Jim, can you, uh, on yeah, go ahead. Can you share again? And this time yeah. you share your, uh, oh, you talking to yourself, share your sound this time. Yes, thank you. Uh -huh, uh -huh. That would be important. See, I knew there was going to be one thing that I would goof up. So I uh, apologize, everybody. And let me just back out. Yes. So just so you know, after you hit share screen, you have to hit share computer sound or it doesn't do any good. That's right. Thank you, Dave, for that. Yeah. Appreciate that. Never knew I'd want to ask you to talk more. Uh, uh, <laughs> good point. <Yeah>. Boom. boom. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Here we go. Hi everyone, and thanks for joining us in this new exciting online format and for checking out my new streamlined version of the Conversion Control Workshop. What you see behind me is a conversion that only took me maybe 30 to 40 minutes. Uh, I could, of course, spend more time on it, just like with any conversion, but the point is that you don't have to. You can get there most of the way with a few simple techniques. So uh, I, let me go back to uh, my screen share here and uh, show you a couple other backgrounds here. First of all, let me move this out of the way. All right, what do we have? We've got ah, Starship Enterprise, Star Destroyer Bridge, and uh, one of my favorites, Conversion Control itself, the Millennium Falcon. My point is that zoom backgrounds are a good place to start, but pretty soon you'll want to move on to treasured family photos or errors in your stereo pairs or something a little more challenging too. First, let me show you some of the things you'll need for this process. Of course, you want a standard pair of red cyan anaglyph glasses. I stapled a popsicle stick to these to make them easy to grab in a hurry. Also, for convenience sake, I put a lanyard on this one so that they can hang around your neck. On the software side, I use a trackball because, it, boy, it's a lot easier to make some of those difficult selections in Photoshop when you can just click it and leave it, walk away, make a sandwich, come back, and continue making the selection. Uh, let's see what else you need. Ah, patience. You need a lot of patience, that's for sure, on some of these difficult images. That's the most valuable thing. And finally, there's a couple of tricks I use to give your eyes a break because you're looking through anaglyph glasses for so long. Um, one of them is to stare at a white screen, either bring up a white, you know, like a blank tab and flip the glasses around or literally stare at a lamp with the glasses flipped around. And that speeds up the recharge of your eyes to sort of get them back to neutral. Now I want you to know that even though I use Photoshop, it's not a new version and it doesn't have any 3D modes or anything like that. As a matter of fact, you'll find similar tools in other image editing programs, even free ones like GIMP. I do recommend that whatever you're using, you learn things like selecting, layering, masking, and painting, as well as the tool set to make your conversions go a lot easier. Alright, let's get into it, shall we? I'd like to remind everyone that this workshop is completely in anaglyph, so keep those glasses on, set your zoom program to full screen, and up at the top there's a little view options drop down where you can set it to fit to window. This simply allows you to maximize the image size on your monitor. Also I recommend cranking the brightness up all the way because it really helps anaglyphs. Okay, let me just step up to the chalkboard here. I'd like to point out that even though we're working in anaglyph, what you'll have when you're finished is a full color stereo pair from which you can make whatever format you would like, parallel, cross-eye, etc. The reason I work this way in anaglyph, or McManaglyph, thanks to Dave Camo, is simply speed and flexibility. It's universally viewable with no fixed requirement for distance, focus, angle of view, or size even. Just try this with side by side. You can zoom in and out and check your work in detail. It's also fairly easy to check your cropping and set your stereo window by rolling the cursor, which is at screen depth, over the image. 
Anaglyphs are also nice because they allow you to view the image full screen, which is twice as large as any side-by-side -side format. I should also mention here that I work in layers, not just in channels. This is a very common question. Some tools can't be used unless all the channels are selected in a layer. For example, the Move tool. The key is, if you only work with separate channels, you are then limited to only having an anaglyph when you're finished. I'd like to have a full color stereo pair and I can make any format I choose. So how is a 3D conversion done? Well, there's a few basic approaches. A depth map is a pretty common way, but it has its limitations. We'll look at that in just a second. Slice and dicing means basically selecting small areas of the scene and dragging them over one at a time, and that can be very time consuming, but it's useful for detail work. I use both methods a little bit, plus my own. Think of it as like a pop-up book method, where your image is like a piece of paper and you fold it, you bend it at the corners and at the seams, and you create a 3D scene from it. I'll talk about depth maps first. This would be a very simple example, probably the easiest example of a depth map you could possibly have. If you imagine that a depth map is like you had a flashlight in your hand and you're looking out into the scene and you don't see any color or detail, only brightness level, and anything that's closer to your camera is going to reflect more light, therefore it's brighter. So when this depth map is applied to this image, what you end up with is this. Now notice it's not perfect. There's a little bit of curvature down here at the bottom of the frame, like as if the road is dipping into a sinkhole or something. But we can either fix that manually, which would be kind of time consuming, or approach it from an entirely different way, which I'll show you in a minute. Of course, most depth maps are a little more complicated than that one. For example, what would you do on a hallway shot like this? Well, there's actually four geometric planes intersecting at the infinity point. So to help me illustrate that, I drew some lines, which I could overlay on the image and then created this depth map, which gets you most of the way there. It's not perfect, but it does give you a nice 3D effect versus this 2D version of the same scene. Now, if I really wanted to go in and add detail, I would recess the doorways and pop out the lights and do some other detail work. But that certainly gets us off to a good start. Another type of depth map involves round objects. I created this spherical depth map before I was aware that I could do the same thing much easier and quicker in Stereo Photo Maker. Mine involved a lot of math, but I think the results turned out pretty good when you compare it to the 2D version. Sometimes depth maps can do most of the heavy lifting, but frequently clean up by hand is required. In this image from my Niagara Falls project, I began with depth mapping, but very quickly could see the limitations of this method with frequent gaps at the seams and blurring and smearing on the trailing edges, so I had to figure something else out. But after a lot of extra time cleaning it up by hand, I think the results are really worth it, especially compared with the 2D version. Now you can zoom in and really see so much detail that was never visible before, like the guard standing at the gate and the car near the front entrance, and I'm really proud of how this one turned out. This was one of my first real challenging conversions. The last thing I wanted to do was replace that boring blank sky with something a little more interesting, and sky replacements can be done very easily with these techniques. Another shot that needed some attention due to restricted access was this one of the inside of a power plant near Niagara. I first began with a fairly simple depth map, which got me most of the way there, but you can see there's a lot of errors still to go. So I went in and did some pixel shifting by hand and came up with this, which I think is a pretty faithful representation of what an actual 3D picture would look like. So let's just go back and have a look at that roadway and see how we could do this very simply with two approaches. The first is going to be with a depth map. Now, like I mentioned, any image that you work on needs to be in RGB mode. So you would do that up here on the menu bar under Image, Mode, RGB Color. I prefer to leave the color in my anaglyphs. Uh, I know it's easy to take it all out and just go with the black and white because it makes for less rivalry on the eyes, but I use a special channel mixer layer here that allows me to keep most of the color while not having it flash like the original image would with the blue being bright in your right eye and dark in your left eye, etc. So this channel mixer layer really helps me make sense of things and wear the anaglyph glasses for a very long time. Now what we're going to do is duplicate this image. Now I recommend if you have an image that needs any cleanup work, do it now before you duplicate it and start doing the conversion because you don't want to have to do it twice. So what I'm going to do here is just simply copy the image by duplicating its layer and I'm going to name let's say the top one L and the bottom one R and it's just my personal habit but I usually like to leave the left one alone. I know which one I've left alone and then 
I know which one I need to make right. So I leave the left image untouched, and that way I can always go back and grab elements from it. Okay, now let me show you what I've done here. I've just gone ahead and duplicated the image and named one layer L and one layer R. And I've gone L over R, but you can do the opposite as long as you keep track of it. Now with each, I've linked a channel mixer and this channel mixer on the left image is only going to give us red, but if you notice, I don't have it at 100% red. I have it at like 25% and then 50% green because most luminance is carried by the green channel. And then about 25% blue to round it out. On the green and the blue, zero all the way down. So we don't get any green and blue through for the left image, just the red channel. But we've done a custom mix here and that'll help alleviate that retinal rivalry caused by clashing colors. Now for the right channel, now for the right channel mixer, we leave red at zero all the way down. And then for green, I go with about 25% red mixed in to mostly green. 75% green, 25% red, and blue about the same. 25% red, 75% blue. Instead of being 100% blue, this way it helps reduce that retinal rivalry and makes it easy to wear glasses for a long time. Personally, I find it easier to group similar layers into folders, and that way you can start adding elements to it and have them all be affected by the same channel mixer. So here, I can select the right layer and its channel mixer, group it into a folder, and I'll just call that R. Nothing fancy. And the same with the left layer and its channel mixer. I'll just group those, call that L. I know I'm so creative. Now, let me open up these folders, turn on their channel mixers, and what's going to happen is right now you're only seeing the left layer because it's not letting any light, we'll call it, shine through down to the right layer. So we need to change its blending mode from pass through. I know that sounds contradictive because it's not actually letting light pass through. We're going to go down here to lighten or screen. They both work the same in this case. And now what we have is basically the same thing as if you're looking at the image in mono. I've duplicated the image to both eyes, but they are being separated by your glasses. And you'll see the change here in just a second. Now at this point, we're going to veer off my normal track and see how we would do a depth map. I'm going to make a new layer. It doesn't really matter where I place it, as long as I can see through it to the road in this case. I'm just going to go ahead and move that layer to the very top, make it easy to find. Grab my gradient tool, and I'm going to draw a nice straight line right up from the bottom of the frame to the horizon. And the shift key can help me do that. Stop right at the horizon, and what you'll get is a simple gradient where it actually fades from gray to black. Now what we need to do is save this image as a Photoshop file, and I will just name it Map to make it easy to find later. Put it on the desktop. And there we have it. Okay, I'm going to turn off that gradient layer that we made, go back to my right hand layer, because that's the one I always change. And I'm simply going to go up to the filter menu, go down to distort, over to displace, and now it asks me how much do you want to displace the image by? Well, vertically, zero, because the golden rule of conversions is don't move anything vertically. Horizontally, I don't know, let's uh, start around 50 pixels and see what we get. Okay, it's going to ask me where that map file is I created. There it is, map PSD, open, and there it is. Now, it just shifted the image by 50 pixels in the background up to zero pixels right in the foreground. And you can see there's a little bit of smearing over here on the left-hand edge. But overall, it gives us a pretty nice anaglyph. Of course, the road does dip a little bit in the foreground because evidently the gradient tool is not completely linear. But for starters, this is great 3D. Now let's take a look at my pop-up book way. I'm just going to undo the displacement, delete the map layer, we don't need that anymore, and we're back to a mono image essentially. Now what I found out is that with a couple of simple tools, I can do all these geometric distortions and do them properly. And my approach boils down to three steps. Lay it down, pop it up, and fill it out. So the first step is always to sort of lay down the landscape. And in this case, I'm going to use the skew tool to do that. And that's under the edit menu, and it's a transform tool. If I go to skew, and I have the right layer selected, 
it gives me some little handles up here. The important thing about the skew is you only want to select the top middle or the bottom middle. Now watch what happens when I drag the top over to the right. Now we're suddenly able to get a 3D image. Now to go one step further, I'm going to select the image at the horizon. Oops, don't let it run off the screen. And I'm going to bend it back the other way. Remember, it's a piece of paper at this point. I bent it down, I laid it down, and now I'm going to bend the sky back this way toward us. So you can have a fairly simple 3D effect. Now you notice the edges leave a lot to be desired. So then what I can do is very simply draw a box select the inverse of that box. First I need to make a new layer. Put this up here above everybody. I'm going to fill it with black. And there you have it. The same thing could have been achieved with the cropping tool, but once you trim off the edges, you lose the ability to go back and change your mind. Now that's a very simple pop-up book procedure. And we've essentially done the same thing that we could have done with a depth map, but much quicker and with a lot more control. Now something I should mention here is that the initial move, being the layback of the landscape, sort of determines your depth budget. It's as if you're setting the interocular spacing of a stereo photo. Now let's take a closer look at those tools we need. The first thing we'll look at is the Move tool. So I'm going to go over here to the left hand side on my tool palette, select the Move icon, and in this case only I have the text and the background separated on different layers so I can manipulate them individually but normally of course that's not the case when you're doing a conversion. Now because I have these elements on separate layers when I select the text and I move it a little bit left I can bring it forward in front of the background. If I move to the right it'll recede into the background. In this case that doesn't look good but I could go grab my background and move it to the right and give me a little bit of space to play with. So now the text is able to move more freely and you have some 3D space to place it. Notice that I'm never moving things vertically, only horizontally, so I'm just shifting left and right. The second tool we'll look at is actually a transformation located up here in the edit menu under transform and I select scale. I've already got the layer that I want to uh, adjust selected. Now this is useful when you want to leave one side anchored but bring the other side forward or backward. So for example, I could leave the S where it is and bring the E forward by going left a little bit or backward by going right a little bit. I could leave that where anchored where it is, go to the other side, bring it forward. So that's a really useful tool to have in your toolkit. The third tool we'll look at is Skew. Now this is also a transform located up here in the Edit menu under Transform, Skew. And I've got my layer already selected and you see this box forms around it. Uh, in this case I want to leave either the top or bottom anchored unlike Scale which did the left or right side. So I'm going to drag the opposite side. Let's say I want to push the top back toward the background. So I'm going to take the top, grab only the middle because if you grab the corners it'll get distorted. So I push that to the right a little bit to anchor it, apparently, with the background. And now I can grab the bottom edge, bring it to the left to bring it out, and really give it some extreme 3D depth. And then, of course, to apply that layer, you hit the Enter key. By the way, the Skew tool basically does exactly the same as the Perspective tool, as long as you make sure to only grab the middle of that top box. Now in most cases you'll probably want to use a combination approach where you'll use a little bit of each tool. So I might for example move this out to bring it forward and then go and get my scale tool and bring one side toward me a little more than the other one. Perhaps even recess the other one. And then go grab the skew tool. Again this would do the same thing as the perspective tool as long as you only grab the middle of the top or bottom side and then you can tilt it bring that forward like that boom and that was a very quick transformation using all three of those tools now that all works fine if the elements you have are on separate layers but what about every photograph that you want to convert where it's all mixed together already well the key is in the selecting and how you do it it's easy enough to select this subject because it all is uniform in color 
So I could use a tool like the magic wand to do it very easily. But notice what happens when I move it over. I grab the move tool, go to the side a little bit. I leave a doubled image behind it, and that's no good. So I might choose instead to modify my selection by including all the gaps between the letters in this case. Let's just real quickly do that, very quickly and sloppily. Now let's see what happens when I move it to the side. Okay, that's better. At least between the words is not as offensive. Still, you would want to push the grass back a little bit, but there's still a little problem on the side. So I might choose to over-select, actually, and sort of make a jagged selection so that it almost masks it a little bit. And of course, you can feather it and make a softer selection as well, but this is just a real quick one for demonstration purposes. And then you can move that over, and you have a lot more leeway to do what you want without interfering and creating problems that you have to go clean up later. I see a quick one down here in the corner that I can just select and move something in place and cover that up real quick. And overall, that's pretty acceptable. And then, of course, you can go in and push the grass back between the letters. Sometimes it helps to put a duplicate layer underneath the one that you're actually working on. For example, I'm first going to tilt the background back just a little bit with a quick skewer perspective move. And now let's say I want to bring the text back forward again so it tilts forward so it appears to be maybe standing straight up. And let's say you went to all the necessary precautions of over selecting by including background between objects, increasing the distance on the trailing edge a little bit, Notice how I triangulate it a little bit because I'll be tilting the top more than the bottom. Now what happens is when you go up here and select, again, skew or perspective, and you grab it at the top and you bring it back, it starts to look okay, but oops, what happened there on the right side? You opened up a hole. So what needs to happen is before you make that transformation, make a duplicate of the layer underneath or actually on top of the one that you're working on, you'll end up working on the top layer. And now you can make that transformation and it'll cover up the hole for you and you have a lot more leeway to move. Now again, I would go push the grass back, but that requires a little manual labor. And then that's a heck of a lot better than having a big ugly hole you have to go repair later. Doing a conversion can be tedious, but it can also be fun in addition to certainly being rewarding. You can treat it like a chess game and come back to it a little bit at a time. Pretty soon you'll find yourself thinking in perspectives when approaching how to build a scene. When you're finished converting, it's very easy to create a side-by-side -side pair. At this point, you can also set the stereo window by moving the entire right folder left or right. Just draw a box around the portion of the image that you want to keep and then select Crop in the Image menu to trim away the unwanted edges. Now just go up to Canvas Size, increase the width by 200%, and go ahead and anchor the images to one side. In this case, I put them on the left. In this case, I'm just going to change my screen mode real quick so you can see the entire width. Go ahead, open the folders, and switch off the anaglyph filters. Just drag the entire right folder over to the right, snap it into place, and there we have it. We have a full color stereo pair. Adding a channel mixer just makes it more palatable for your anaglyph viewing right now. You can fix sync errors and cha-chas and hyper stereos, increase or decrease depth, repair or enhance subject matter, or even use one part of an image to fix the other one. This shot needed just a little more depth, so I stretched the landscape a little bit to give more of a sense of the terrain. And this shot had limited depth due to my distance to the subject, so I got down as close as I could to the waterline, but I still thought I could use a little more depth, so with one very simple move, I stretched the foreground to meet right at your feet. I find it's pretty common to want to add depth to a shot, but occasionally you actually want to remove depth. This shot of a wild columbine flower was taken with too much disparity, resulting in a stereo image that's very hard to fuse. You can either get the background or the foreground, but not both. So I de-emphasized the depth and came up with this image. Sync errors can be fixed easier than you would think. A stereo pair that might otherwise go in the trash can often be rescued by using elements from one side to repair the other, like in this shot where the trooper turned his head. I simply copied and pasted and then added depth to the helmet and actually got two usable pairs from one unusable one. 
You can change content, like add these flowers that were never in bloom, or add a much more interesting sky and a few more birds to boot. Also change elements you never thought you could, like this rocky gravel beneath the fish. I swapped it with some algae-covered rocks for a more natural appearance. Finally, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the steps involved in my most difficult conversion to date. I started by simply taking this flat photograph of Flushing Meadows Park and laying it back with one skew move. Then I started adding detail by popping up a few select buildings in the light post. Then I pop up the globe with one skew move, but it still needed a lot of work to bring out the depth in front of it and behind it. A little math was involved, but I managed to get some nice texture in front of the globe. The rest was still yet to come. Next I added some depth to the trees with multiple skew moves because they were all attached at the base. And finally the real trick was adding depth to the back of the globe, and I did that with a series of careful masks and again reversing the math that I had used to pop the depth out in the first place. Finally, I added a new sky and increased the color and contrast a little bit. And there we have it. That's a far cry from the original image. Let's just focus on the four basic steps in the globe. I laid it back with one skew move, popped it up with another skew move, filled out the front with a circular depth map, and then with careful masking and the reverse of that depth map, popped out the back. That was not easy. Well, there you have it. I guess class is dismissed. There's so much more to it than what I've presented here, but at least I hope I've inspired you to try some of these things on your own photos. Check out my website for more anaglyphs and contact me at this email address if you have any questions. All right. Okay. Can you guys hear me okay? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yep. we can hear. Uh, yep. Was the volume? <laughs> yeah, I love the applause. <laughs> I hope the volume was okay on that throughout. I figured people could turn it up or down as they needed. I just kind of set it in the middle. Yeah, it sounded great, Jim. Awesome, awesome. Well, you can tell I put a lot of work into that. I was, uh, I mean, it was a completely new, you know, workshop. Just made me rethink everything. And by the time you redo something, you become better at it in in analyzing how you did it. You know, so just the process of going back and trying to teach all you guys. Uh, will also obviously make me a better uh, converter and also hopefully enable you guys to try it as well. And like I said, uh, my email there at the end, jim at life is 3d.com. Don't hesitate uh, to contact me uh, for questions or if you want me to uh, do one for you. So uh, I really appreciate you guys sitting through that. I know it was a lot of info. You could tell editing was my friend, but no thunderstorms. I didn't have a power outage. So there you go. That worked out. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's great, Jim. Are you going to be in... Uh... On, on the Facebook uh, page, or are you gonna be in the High Fidelity if anybody has any questions or post things uh, there? I would imagine, yeah, I'll bounce around. I know I haven't even taken a look at the chat yet, but I'll uh, make sure to save a copy of that before we end this thing. And um, also, uh, yeah, I'll check out High Fidelity. And what'd you say the other thing was, Facebook? The Facebook uh, page, right. Yep, yeah, there's yep. a link to that, right. Yep, there's Facebook and uh, yep. So uh, yeah, if, if people also, if you want to save the chat, there's a three little ellipses at the right hand side. Yeah, and I'll take a that. look at that later. I learned to grab it real quick before the meeting ends. <laughs> and um, and I'll look at that later for anybody you know whose questions I didn't answer. Obviously, uh, I was doing other things during the presentation. So uh, and I did, every time I learned you, every time you move your mouse, the play symbols come up on top of your video, even if you've got the chat on a different screen. So I couldn't like touch my computer at all. It was funny. <laughs> hands off, hands off. Yeah. Well, one one thing that we could do if our if our presenters, if Jim Harp and Jim McManus would like to take questions, uh, post this. You can actually start your own Zoom rooms and then post those links on the Facebook page and people can meet up with you uh, in your own Zoom and ask questions after this. Eric, sorry, you're very, very, very low, but just, just to rebroadcast, Eric is saying if you or Jim want to create your own Zoom rooms right. on, and post the link on the Facebook, then you could answer more questions uh, and you could have those kind of things. Unfortunately, we have these kind of like tight together, so we don't have a lot of time. Today. What, what time does the next thing start? 6.30? Is that the, uh, what's next? Happy hour? I think, uh, I think at 6.30. No, next, next, next we have the, the uh, 
3D in social media SIG. And, and when I say 6.30, I'm talking Eastern time. On, on, the, on the half hour, yes. Yeah, okay, all right, all right, hour. cool. But I will do it until then, sure. Yeah, definitely. I'm eager to start checking stuff out myself. I tell you what, I'm just I'm eager to take a breath. This has been awesome. And I've got a couple, like I said, a couple shows coming up in theater. So I just, after going to these conventions for so long, my first one was back in 95 in Atlanta. And, you know, for a while, I didn't take any pictures at all because I was into seeing stuff. And then I just suddenly realized over the years, it became more about the people. And that's really the connections that we're here for and that we really benefit from in so many ways. So uh, I love all you guys and I uh, wish I could be there in person to give you hugs. And uh, we should remind everyone that uh, the day is ending with a happy hour and we'd actually love to have the presenters in the happy hour as well. So uh, you'll have an opportunity to ask some questions there. Cool. Right, yeah, the happy hour is just kind of a little bit unplanned. It's just, a, it's an area where you can come and. Uh, ask questions and just kind of socialize and be together. So, and and we'll have your mics turned on for that. <laughs> yep. All right. Thanks, everybody. Um, we will see you in the next session, beginning in about twenty-five minutes. And feel free to go to the website, look at the artwork, go to Facebook, uh, look at things, go to High Fidelity, do all that good stuff. Cool. Excellent. Good job, guys. Thanks, everyone.